Welcome everybody to this seminar, um, an ASEM's uh, virtual public lecture. We're extremely lucky today to have um, a very distinguished professor, Professor Ji Hong Lin from Harvard. And she's going to tell us about um, COVID-19 data in Wuhan, USA and the rest of the world. And she's going to tell us about risk factors, transmission and intervention strategies. Before I go on, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Peter Taylor. I'm the director of ASEMS, um, which is the uh, Center of Excellence that's sponsoring this seminar. And I work at the, the School of Mathematics and Statistics at the University of Melbourne. University of Melbourne um, is on the, the, the traditional owners of the land on which I both live and work. The Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation are the traditional owners of the land where I sit. Uh, they've been custodians of the land for thousands of years. And I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I certainly welcome any other Aboriginal elders of other communities who may be online today and, uh, and uh, pay my respects to them as well. So as I said, we're delighted to welcome Professor Lin. Uh, I think um, I'm very excited that she agreed to come and talk to us about um, her research. She is uh, the Professor of Biostatistics um, and uh, the Coordinating Director of the Program in Quantitative Genomics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Um, she's a professor of statistics at Harvard University. She has a long list of awards. Um, you can look at them if you want to log into Professor Lin's webpage. Um, as I say, she has, uh, I've, I've seen her previous seminar, which is incredibly interesting, and I'm sure she's going to be able to update us on stuff like that. So I'm very much looking forward to this, and I'll invite Professor Lin to start. So thank you. And uh, thanks so much, Peter, for inviting me. It's a great honor and, uh, to share my work uh, with the community. So let me share my screen. On the... So I'll share with some of the work we have done in the last few months. Uh, so let me start uh, from where we are. So uh, this is the number of cases and, uh, and also number of deaths and of COVID-19 and uh, I collect, uh, um, found from the internet today. So you can see there are over 10 million cases and also over ha about half a million deaths in the world. So this is a, 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 it's a, a pandemic, and uh, so it affects many, many countries in the world. So on the left is this an, uh, the case curve, and you can see the um, uh, U.S. is now doing well, and Brazil, and the Indians, and Mexico, and the number of cases has been going up, and Australia are doing great, and, and also China. Just as, as you can see the curve, recently Australia has a little uh, surge. On the right, and uh, so it seems this is the number of deaths, you can see Australia is doing really well. Uh, as well. So the, um, as all we know, and the COVID-19 has a huge multifaceted impact in so many dimensions, uh, including the lives and the economy, education, and also uh, research, uh, which has affected many, many of us. So therefore, it's important and to use the, the COVID-19 data and to understand the epidemics. And uh, so I'm going to share with you and um, some of the analysis we have done using the Wuhan data, US data, and also the data across the world. And so, so therefore we can develop uh, evidence-based uh, uh, research strategies and uh, to uh, fight uh, against COVID-19. So let me start from uh, Wuhan. And uh, Wuhan is a beautiful city. And uh, it is in the middle part of China. So you can see on the left hand, uh, left -hand side, this, figure, this picture shows a river in the background. This is the Changjiang River. It's the longest river in China. On the right hand side, and uh, so this is a beautiful lake called the East Lake. And so in March, generally, there is a, a cherry blossom. And uh, so, however, something happened on the, in December, and uh, that was the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. So um, I started working on COVID-19 uh, research in uh, late February, and in collaboration with Chao Long Wang, who was my former postdoc, and then he joined the uh, 
the School of Public Health in Huazhong Science and Technology University located in Wuhan. And so we um, analyzed the 26,000 uh, cases and uh, until um, uh, uh, late uh, uh, mid February. And then to help uh, uh, the um, US and other countries and uh, to uh, fight the COVID-19, we immediately posted this uh, preprint in Med Archive on March 6. And so uh, this work has attracted a lot of attention. And so you can see this is a number of abstract views and uh, there's over 124,000 and also uh, uh, almost a 50K um, PDF download as well. And so I posted the summary of the key findings and in tweet, and so that helped help with disseminating the findings. And the first part of this um, um, Med Archive preprint and was published in JAMA because uh, we decided to split the paper into two parts because uh, the work was a little bit too much in a single paper to be submitted to a journal. And so this, um, so in this um, uh, Java uh, JAMA paper, and uh, we updated the analysis using 32,000 cases until March 8. And so also uh, this work has also attracted a lot of attention. And so this is a particular matrix and uh, which had been used uh, in the um, journals. And uh, so you can see this uh, paper has rank, it's a rank over uh, is in the top 0.01% among the 15 million articles has been published. And so also this work has attracted a lot of uh, media coverage and also the interviews and uh, for, uh, in both the US and also Europe as well. And also I testified in the um, UK Parliament Science and Technology Committees on April uh, 17, and later on, and the, the committee prepared a letter to the prime ministers and make uh, 10 recommendations. I was uh, honored to see several of the recommendations and uh, I discussed at my testimonies and was included. Uh, so I'll discuss some of those findings. So let me start from the JAMA paper. And uh, so the, as I mentioned in the JAMA paper, we analyzed 32,000 cases uh, in Wuhan until March 8. So the left hand side is the number of cases as uh, displayed in a histogram on daily basis. And uh, so on the right, this is a estimated R curve. So I think by now many of you are familiar with this RT. This measures the effective reproductive members. And so that basically measures the number of infected subjects per case. So if RT is greater than one, that is bad. So that means one case could affect more than one case. And uh, so the epidemic um, is not under controlled. If RT less than one, that is good. Then that means the epidemic is under controlled. And uh, so bef uh, in Wuhan, the data analysis, we divide the data uh, into a uh, five period. And uh, before January 23rd, and there was no intervention. And uh, so the, on January 23rd, that was the launch of the city lockdown. And uh, so, um, between January 23rd and February 2nd, and uh, so this was the, during the city lockdown, there was a social distancing. And uh, uh, then um, after February 2nd, that was the launch of the centralized isolation quarantines. I'm going to explain what that is on top of social distancing. So if you look at this estimate R curve, you can see this disease is very, very infectious. So the estimated R values uh, without intervention is over three. And after social distancing uh, was launched, uh, when the city was locked down, and the R value dropped quickly and close to one. And uh, so after the centralized isolation and the quarantine was launched, and uh, then you can see this R value um, uh, dropped uh, furthermore. And uh, by March 8, that was close to 0.1. So the epidemic was under control. And uh, so this result of the social distancing reducing R and uh, to um, uh, 
lingered around one has been replicated in many countries. So in statistics and also in other scientific fields, we all know that it's very important the result will be replicable and in other settings. And so if you look at the data in Italy on the left, and so you can see in the bottom, that is the R curve, you can see the, uh, the Italy uh, in um, March and April, they launched the social distancing. And so the car, R curve was stuck around the one for over a month. And also on the right, and this is a Germany data. And similarly, and to the Italy data, the R curve was stuck around one and for over a month as well. And so basically the Wuhan result was replicated. That shows that social distancing definitely helped, but was not good enough. It helped um, reduce R to one, on the, but was not able to bend the curve, like what happened in Wuhan. So this is the first takeaway. And the social distancing greatly helped flatten the curve, but was not enough. And uh, so the explanation is the social distancing helped block community transmissions. So that basically is a bring household transmissions. And uh, however, the family and the within household transmission is common. So here, what we mean by household is broadly defined in the sense that people live in the same place and uh, they may not uh, be relatives. And uh, for example, in the nursing homes. And so the infected cases and it might affect the household members and the close contact. And uh, so what this tells us that is the social distancing helped reduce R to be around one, but was not good enough to fully stop the um, uh, pandemic. So those are the two stories. And the one was in March in New York time. So you can see on the left and the seven family members and the were infected and four of them died. On the right, this is a very recent story it was just uh, published uh, two days ago. 28 members in LA and were test positive. They were all within the same household. So what that tell us is the within household and the com close the place transmissions is common. And uh, to understand whether this is the case and the in US and, uh, and also other risk factors and associated with um, COVID-19 infection. And uh, together with several colleagues, we launched this app we called How We Feel. And so this app uh, collects the COVID uh, symptoms and health status. And this was launched in April 4. And this was uh, joined with a colleague at the Broad Institute, Feng Zhang, who is most well known for his work in CRISPR and uh, gene editing. And also Ben Superman, who is the uh, CEO of Pinterest. And so in this app, and so we have over half a million users. And also um, we had over four, uh, 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 4 million responses. And uh, so um, this is the um, uh, result um, from the How We Feel app. And uh, we analyzed analyze the data up to early May. So as you can see, the, this is the uh, logistic regression result and uh, showing the uh, symptoms and the uh, still showing the exposure effect on the risk of infection. And so you can see that um, the within household exposure, and uh, there is a very significant association with the COVID-19 um, infection. So the odds ratio is almost 17. And so the community exposure and so that means somebody is exposed, uh, a person is exposed to somebody in the community and uh, not in the household. And then the odds ratio is about three. And so what this tell us is the within household exposures and also within community exposure are highly uh, significantly associated with the infection, especially within household exposure. So what this tell us is we need to break the household and the close to place uh, transmission chain. And so those uh, close place include like a nursing home, homeless shelters and the prison. So the, so how can we do that? So the idea is pretty simple. So basically the idea is to, we need to isolate those infected and the quarantine those uh, suspected cases and the close contact. 
So basically, in order to control the um, epidemics, so what we need to do is to reduce the number of new infection. So how can we reduce the number of new infection? So basically, we need to control the source of infection. So this can be illustrated and using this little cartoon. So on the left, you can see these are three communities. And uh, so the red um, triangle indicates the, the index cases, infected index cases. And the blue circle indicates the infected family members and the close contacts. And so, so if one use the home quarantines, and so you can see the uh, infected cases are likely to uh, infect uh, household members. So to um, block the uh, the transmission chain. So if if one takes the infected cases out of the network and then um, isolate infected cases and quarantine the uh, suspected cases and close contact, then you can see the family members are uh, protected and uh, so they are not infected. So the idea is pretty uh, simple. So this is what was done in Wuhan. And Wuhan implemented the centralized isolation and quarantine strategies after February 1. And so um, the subjects were divided into four groups. The first group is the lab confirmed cases. Those are the cases who were test positive. And so those, they built about 16 field hospitals and two uh, new hospitals. And uh, so those 16 hospitals, and uh, they were converted from the stadium or the convention centers. And then, um, uh, the, unlike the US, uh, they admitted um, the mild and the moderate cases in the field hospitals. Then in US, the um, only the severe cases were admitted to the hospital, the mild cases, and they were um, isolated at home. And uh, so if anybody is um, of those uh, cases uh, in the field hospitals and progress to severe case, and then they were transported to regular hospitals such as ICUs. The second group is, and, and those are the suspected cases. Those are the cases with a symptom, but uh, were not uh, tested yet because at that time there was a shortage of the testing kits. And uh, so the third group was the group who had a fever. And uh, for those two groups, and uh, so they were uh, quarantined on the in designated hotels. If uh, then, uh, the family stayed together, and so the small children stay with the parents in the same room, older children have their private room. So uh, if any of them became a confirmed case, they were test positive, and then they were transferred to the field hospitals. The last group, is the group of those people who were contact traced. So those who were close contact and they were quarantined on the designated hotel or universe, uh, university dorms. If any of them um, the, was um, test positive and then they were transferred to the field hospitals. If any of those um, people in the group two to four and uh, if they were test negative in two weeks and then they went home. And so this strategy worked well in Wuhan. And on March 18, just after uh, one half months on the field hospital, uh, the, um, uh, the city uh, was uh, locked down. And uh, then no confirmed cases in the Hubei province. And also on March, April 8, and uh, after two weeks, there was no confirmed cases and the city was reopened. So the take home message number two, this tell us by adding the centralized isolation and the quarantine and uh, um, that uh, help um, on top of social distancing, that help bend the curve and stop the epidemic in Wuhan. And so the, the, this uh, strategy help block the within household transmissions. So basically it, it helped prevent infected cases from infected, infecting household members. And also patient could receive uh, medical care immediately, especially at early stage. And uh, then they were also followed closely about their progression. And uh, then um, 
So this uh, help reduce the chance of progression to becoming severe case and also reduce the deaths and also help reduce the burden of ICU and the PPE. So this um, tells us the take home uh, message number three. So in order to control the outbreak, and uh, one need multiple um, multifaceted uh, measures to control the epidemics. It cannot be a single measure. So basically, it needs to have uh, six pillars, including uh, mask wearing, social distancing, widespread testing, contact tracing, isolation, quarantine, and uh, uh, treatment. And uh, so um, there were two, um, I worked with a few colleagues and uh, so, um, so one was we uh, working with like a Harvey Fenberg and uh, he was our former provost and also the uh, former president of the National Academy of of uh, medicine, and also Jim Kim, and who was a former uh, president of the uh, World Bank. And so a group of us uh, worked together, prepared for this um, uh, uh, New York Times uh, uh, op-ed that was published in um, early April, and uh, calling for the importance of testing, tracing, and isolation quality. And also, uh, Dr. Kim has another very nice uh, op-ed uh, in the New York Times about those measures as well. And also, the, so what this tell us is uh, social distancing help uh, flatten the curve, but in order to bend the curve, uh, we need to do more than social distancing, and especially test, the trace, and isolate. So Massachusetts was the first state that launched the contact tracing program. And uh, so um, a few of us was on the um, uh, task force of Massachusetts. And then uh, later on, the three state, including New Jersey and uh, New York and also uh, Connecticut, and they also launched the test and trace program. And also uh, WHO and, uh, um, uh, suggested uh, um, test the trace and isolate. This is an important strategy. And similarly, and the, the UK um, uh, com uh, Committee of Science and Technology in their letter to the Prime Minister, and uh, they propose uh, this as well. And so to do the um, uh, test, trace, and isolate. And so the first thing is a test. So let's see and uh, who were tested uh, in US. So we analyzed the how we feel data. And so this is what we found. And we found that the people who had symptoms and uh, especially the CDC symptoms, they were much more likely uh, to be tested. And uh, then the uh, essential workers and healthcare workers, and they were more likely to be tested as well. So these results basically were based on logistic regression and using the uh, whether a person was tested yes, no as outcome, and then uh, the symptoms and also demographic information as the independent variables. And uh, so what are the risk factors for infection? So this is what we found using the Wuhan data. And so we found that age and, uh, and also healthcare workers, and they are, have much higher risk of being infected. So on the left, that shows the attack rate and uh, stratified by the five uh, period, and also uh, further stratified by age. So you can see that the purple and the yellow uh, bars and for the elderly, and they have a much higher risk of infection. And uh, so on the right, and so based on the Wuhan data, and uh, male and female have a similar risk of infection, but healthcare workers and those are marked by purple, and then you can see they have much higher risk of infection compared to the general public, especially when there was no PPE protection and before February and one, and because uh, there was um, a, a lack of awareness of um, of the infection, and uh, especially when there was no um, intervention. So how about the risk factors in US? So this is the analysis result using the how we feel data. And uh, so we um, found that um, um, 
gender, race, healthcare worker, and essential workers, they are uh, associated with, the, they are the risk factors and for the infection. And so as I mentioned, and because not everybody has the opportunity of being tested because of shortage of testing kits. And uh, so therefore the people who are tested, this is a by sample. So in the analysis, and uh, so when we uh, analyze those people who are tested, and uh, then we want to see the, um, we did a logistic regression regressing those who were test positive, yes, no, uh, um, on the risk factors. And so to account for the selection bias of the people who were tested, they are by the sample. Basically, the sick people were more likely to be tested. And then we applied the inverse probability weighted uh, um, method and uh, to correct for the selection bias. So this logistic regression results are presented into two parts. Uh, the left part is the unweighted analysis. The right part is the weighted analysis. So. Um, so the major findings are the males are at higher risk of infection compared to females. And second, and uh, we um, found that the uh, uh, people of color, especially black and Hispanic, they are at higher risk um, of infection. And so this indicate um, uh, health disparity, especially racial um, health disparities. And so this result, uh, was found after we controlling for the uh, demographic information and social economic status, and also symptoms as well. And third, healthcare workers and essential workers, and they were at higher risk of infection. You can see their odds ratios are greater than one. And uh, so, in uh, this uh, slide, it shows that the top seven towns in Massachusetts and uh, uh, which have the highest uh, infection rate. And those top seven towns all have a higher, high um, percentage of underrepresented minority, including the uh, African Americans and also Hispanic. So they can, so, so therefore health disparity, especially the people of colors, and uh, they were infected most. And also we look at what are the most important symptoms for a test positive. And it turns out um, loss of taste and smell, this is the most, most important symptom. And but in early uh, phase of the epidemic, and this symptom was not recognized. And the CDC recommended uh, this symptom and in uh, April. So the early time is more about the fever and the cough. Those were the major symptoms. So if you look at the odds ratio, you can see this odds ratio is very, very high um, for the, uh, associated with the loss of taste and smell. And also fever and cough, they are important symptoms as well. And also, we use the um, how we feel data to develop a prediction model and for a positive test. And so if you can see on the left and so this use all the variables on the right use only four variables and uh, including the loss of taste and smells and also exposures including the, the both household exposure and also community exposure so you can see you only use those four simple exposure and the symptom variables rc using the pre-test uh, data was almost 0.8 and so they seem like those predict um, the uh, risk of infection very well. So the take home message number three is uh, we need to protect the five vulnerable groups and those include healthcare workers, elderly workers, and uh, uh, elderly people, and family members, close contact, and uh, also essential workers, and also people of color, especially uh, black and also Hispanic. And so the challenge here is the, and the, for the uh, people of color, and so uh, they, uh, many of them live in crowded housings and also live in um, a poor neighborhood. And uh, there are lack of health insurance, and also many of them are essential workers and they have to go to work. So it's harder for them to do social distancing and also to do isolation. So those communities need a lot of help.
uh, those should they should have a priorities and for testing and also um, the provide them the opportunity to uh, isolate, for example, at hotels and with uh, a, a free uh, offering of the hotels. Also, we want to see how the epidemic has uh, spread at different uh, resolutions. And so we built a website that provide uh, the estimated uh, R maps and uh, also R curves at different levels, at the country level and the state level and also the county level in US. And also one can use this website to compare the RT values and RT curve between different countries and also the US uh, state and counties and also identify hotspot. So the hyperlink uh, seems like it cannot work in Zoom. So I'm going to stop sharing the screen here and show you the, um, show you the, the website. So this is a website. And uh, so you can see that in this website and this shows the map. So you can easily zoom in for any country you want to see. So I'm going to show you uh, Australia. And so this is Australia. And so you can see if you click here, you can see that currently Australia RT values is about 1.8. And uh, so, uh, so this is, uh, if you click the map, and uh, of Australia, then this RT curve will show up. And so you can see the little bit of uh, research in Australia. Peter mentioned this mainly happening in Melbourne and right now. And so you can click other countries. I'm going to click um, another country here, for example, click the Europe. And so you can see like a France seem like there's a research here. So if you look at here, you can see the France, the RT value is greater than one. And uh, so this is RT is about 1.6. And also it seems like France, France has a research as well. And similarly, and if you look at the Switzerland, and this is RT value is about 1.4. And uh, then there is, uh, this has, it did really well and in April and in May, but seem like there is a research here as well for Switzerland. And also for Austria, Austria did really well in April and uh, you can see it did really well. This is RT curve, well below one, and but seem like there is a research uh, right now in Australia, in Austria as well. And also one can look at uh, the US state. So this is how the US state look like. And uh, so, and one can see that right now, like Florida, as we all know, the south part have um, a lot of um, um, cases and uh, the, the Northeast is doing really well. So one can move this um, to any days you like. And so if you move it to like mid, uh, so I'm going to move it to um, mid May, and you can see the mid way, I think the US was doing really well that after the uh, stay at home um, shelter. Uh, uh, um, but afterwards, and uh, then um, the um, south part of the U.S., they opened quite early and uh, without um, sufficient restrictions. And so you can see this spike. Um, the number of cases gone up dramatically. If you look at Florida, for example, and you can see the number of cases go all the way and to almost um, 10,000 um, per day. And uh, then also the RT value is quite high. Right now, the RT value is about 1.6. And similarly for um, Arizona, and uh, so Arizona, you can see the number of cases quite high as well, and there's quite a sharp rising of the cases, and the RT value is also up, uh, above one. And uh, so Massachusetts is where we I live, and uh, so um, Massachusetts is doing quite well, and uh, so it sees below one, our value is below one, and the curve has been bended. And similarly for New York, New York has been doing well. And uh, so you can see the R value is below one and the curve has been bended as well. And also one can select the, the counties and US counties and that estimate the RT value for um, over um, um, 1200 counties with a sufficient data. And so if you look at, look at here, you can see many, many counties in uh, Florida and have been uh, R value greater than one. And also the California and Arizona, you can see that the uh, um, COVID has been spread uh, as well. And so one can also compare uh, different um, RT values. So for example, I'm going to compare Australia. 
I'm going to compare Australia with uh, um, New Zealand. And I'm going to put um, um, US here as well as just a comparison. And uh, so after do that, I'm going to hit submit. Oh, sorry, I'm not sure. Yeah, here we go. All right, so here you can see the, the RT values and the, so the uh, red is Australia. And so you can see Australia was doing great and but recently there's a little surge. And the, the New Zealand, um, the, is, uh, this is a green curve and New Zealand had been doing great. And because later on New Zealand had new case, so therefore the RT was not calculated. And US was not doing well. If you look at the, 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 um, the, the number of the case curve, you can see the US has much more cases and also the, the curve has been going up. Australia, Australia and uh, New Zealand have been doing really well. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and then go back to the uh, to the slides. Okay. All right. So this is also compare the U.S. Um, RT curves and the, in the north uh, northeast. And so you can see that the northeast uh, has been doing really well. And uh, so because the northeast, all those states, and uh, they um, they uh, um, uh, um, reopened uh, much later, and also they were slow in reopening, and also they all has uh, they all have uh, test trace and uh, isolate uh, measures in place. And uh, so on the right, these are the state in the south, and uh, and also the west, like. Uh, um, Arizona, California, Florida, Georgia, Texas, you can see their R values uh, have all, uh, are all greater than one. Okay, so another thing is important thing is I think probably many of you are interested in is the, um, the role of asymptomatic and the pre-symptomatic cases and uh, in the transmission. And so we um, developed a model we call the um, Shepra model. And uh, so that um, uh, is um, a model, uh, is an extension of the shear model used for modeling a full spectrum of epidemics and to understand the um, asymptomatic and the pre symptomatic transmission. So this is an interpretation. So this S is the uh, susceptible, uh, means susceptible, and the E means exposed. And uh, so this P means uh, pre-symptomatic. And uh, then, um, so the, basically the, the, the disease um, process happens like following. And the, if somebody is infected, then will enter into the pre-symptomatic phase. Generally, this is about three days. And from symptomatic to symptom onset is about two days. And so because not every uh, case was ascertained, so therefore some cases were ascertained, that means those cases were test positive, and some cases were not ascertained, that is the A part. And so those unascertained cases include those um, asymptomatic cases and the mild symptomatic cases. And um, so, um, so then uh, this R indicates removal, this uh, H indicates hospitalization. And uh, so this, to fit this model using the Wuhan 32,000 confirmed cases, and uh, we basically this model is based on Poisson, Poisson model using the differential equation. And so this paper is in Biomed archive and you can download as well. So this basically is the second part of our original Biomed archive paper. And so we add in uh, more, uh, uh, more data and also better model. So how, what did we find from this analysis? So from this analysis, and we divided the Wuhan data into five periods. And the period before January 23rd, and this is no intervention, between January 23rd and February 3rd, and this is social distancing. After February 3rd, and this is centralized quarantine and isolation. And on February 18th, they did a universal screening. And so then you can see that, and before the intervention, and the R value was uh, well above three. 
And after the social distancing, the R value was reduced to close to one, but was not good enough. In order to bend the curve, after adding in the centralized correlation, uh, quarantine and isolation, the R value was dropped all the, uh, much below the one. And also, they seem like the curve fit the data well. OK, then uh, how the intervention helped contain the size of the outbreak. And so this, um, before January 23rd, there was no intervention. And so this blue curve indicated, suppose there's no intervention and for the whole period, this will be the number of the cases we would expect. And so you can see those grow exponentially. And so you can see there is uh, the curve bended. Why? This is the herd immunity. So that means if more than 50 or 60 percent of the cases uh, happened, and then the then herd immunity will happen, then you can see the case curve uh, will go down. And uh, so on the right, and uh, so you can see that after using the social distancing, if the social distancing continues, and then the number of cases will still go up, but at a lower rate. So comparing under those two blue curves, so the interventions after January 23rd together reduce the size and by, uh, of the outbreak by 96%. And intervention after February 2nd, that is basically using the centralized uh, quarantine and isolation plus the social distancing, that reduced the size of the outbreak by 70%. Okay. We are also interested in estimating the proportion of uncertain cases. In particular, those uncertain cases include the pre-symptomatic and the um, asymptomatic and the mild symptomatic cases. So we estimated almost 80%, 87% of the daily new cases were uncertain. So that means that even though the Wuhan, um, the Wuhan data has about 32,000 cases, those were um, uh, test cases who were tested positive, and there was a large number, almost 87% of the cases who were uncertained. Many of them were asymptomatic, were pre-symptomatic cases, were mild symptomatic cases. And uh, so, so the total number of cases we estimated will be about 250,000, and uh, including those uh, asymptomatic and uh, mild symptomatic cases. So what is the implication of those un uncertain uh, uh, cases? So they are very important and, uh, to understand. And because those uncertain cases, including the pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic and also the mild symptomatic cases, and they are still infectious, and so therefore they could still infect others. And then also, then they could have an implication in terms of the reopening policies. And so here on the left, and so this is the curve the y-axis is a probability of research. We estimate the probability of research. And the x-axis is the, the days. OK, so the, the top blue curve is that suppose we, um, the Wuhan uh, reopened after, say, like 14 days. After the first days, the, there was a zero case, zero confirmed case. Because there was zero confirmed case, but they are still uncertain cases, and so therefore those people could still infect others. Then you can see that after 14 days, and uh, um, if the, um, the city were reopened, and uh, after the 14 days, if the, the, so was no, uh, in fact, uh, there was no confirmed case, there was 97% of a chance there will be a research. And uh, then if the cities uh, was uh, reopened after 14 days of um, zero cases always through. That means uh, zero, zero, zero. We observed zero, zero, zero cases for 14 days, and then the city was reopened. Then you can see that there's about third, third this will be this uh, right curve. There are about 33 uh, percent of chance of research. And uh, so in Wuhan, there was a, a research that was observed in, uh, in May. And uh, so the Wuhan reopened after 14 days of no case, um, 
So the right-hand side indicate when the research will happen. And so you can see in this a blue curve. And so that if that means if we observe no zero case in one day, and then when we open, we open right away without any um, restriction. And then after 30 days, and then we will see a research. And so this uh, right curve is suppose that after we observe no case for consecutive 14 days, and then the city was reopened and with no intervention measures, and then the, we will see a research in 40, uh, 40 days, uh, 45 days. And so this assumes there was no measures. So what this tells us is um, because of uncertainty cases, and if lifting the control too early and without any restriction can lead to high probability, higher probability of research. And so this is also illustrated using this figure as well. And uh, so this um, curve on the left, you can see this red part is the uncertained cases. And those yellow part in indicate uncertained cases. And many of them include asymptomatic, multi-symptomatic, and the pre-symptomatic cases. And those, um, uh, sorry, uh, uncertained cases include the asymptomatic and mild symptomatic cases. And so those, um, this uh, yellow, uh, the blue curve indicates the number of um, pre-symptomatic cases we estimated. So on the right, you can see that the suppose that the on day um, in late March and the, the first day of no uh, um, a case, which was ascertained. After 14 days, suppose the city was reopen and if all the controls were lifted then you can see after 14 days and uh, in uh, after 40 uh, after 31 uh, month and uh, then we are going to see a research with a number of cases greater than 100 and so this tells us that one needs to be careful when one reopens um, a city so this talk, take home message number five is giving testing priorities to five vulnerable group, as I mentioned, like elderly, social um, healthcare workers, and uh, family members, close contacts, and also people of color. And also, especially, um, the give testing priority to the uh, asymptomatic and the pre-symptomatic cases. And uh, so the, right now, is, I think the, uh, there's still a shortage of testing capacities and also supplies, such as a swap, and also, the common testing priorities were the people with the symptom, they were more likely to be tested. But now with the um, testing capacities uh, being better and more and more uh, cases and uh, uh, without symptoms were tested. And also, um, so what that means is we would like to, it's important to give the testing priorities, especially when um, we have increasing testing capacities and the give the testing priority to the five vulnerable groups, especially asymptomatic and the pre-symptomatic cases. And as a take home message number six is, it's important to reopen slowly and also in phase. And the reopen, and the, so the countries which have reopened when the number of cases was small have been doing really well. And so, so for example, like Wuhan, they waited until 14 days without cases and uh, they reopened and also like uh, Singapore and uh, the uh, New Zealand and also Australia and uh, so Japan and uh, so they were all doing well and uh, so we uh, so if one opened too early and the one is likely to see uh, more likely to see a research happen quickly like in Florida and also it's important to consider multiple phases and after we open, and it's still important to continue intervention measures and such as mask wearing, social distancing, test, trace, and isolate. And also it is um, uh, expected to have a research if all measures are lifted and also if reopen happened too early. So this is my final slides. And the two, um, 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 fight uh, COVID-19 is important that um, uh, we are united. So everybody is a team member. So Wuhan experience and uh, help us not start from zero. So different countries um, 
cultures and the system are different. And so therefore, each country need to use uh, their own situation to develop their own strategy. And uh, also it's important to let the data speak and the develop evidence-based strategies and uh, to, um, uh, for intervention. And also um, intervention need to be multi-faceted. And uh, so it should not be a single measures. And uh, we have seen in um, multiple data and uh, including the six pillars, as I mentioned. And uh, so all the pillars are important. And uh, so, and also important to pay attention to pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic cases. And also the last part is about reopening and the research. And uh, important to reopen slowly and when the number of cases small and also in phases and also important to keep the intervention measures after we open. And so this is a joint work with many colleagues and student postdocs and uh, in, uh, in the Wuhan in the School of Public Health and many colleagues in how we feel project. And thank you. Thank you very much, Shi Hong. That was fantastic. And I'd like to think that there's a massive um, roar of applause out there, but we can just imagine that that's happening over Zoom. Um, we have actually got um, a bunch of questions that have happened and, and I'll try and relay them. I think that's probably the best. Um, and if anyone else has got some questions, please use the Q&A feature and I'll try and uh, at least we'll ask a few before we uh, get to the end of time. So Xi Hong, um, we did have someone who came late who wanted to know about papers or data reports and you'd actually started out by quoting your papers and someone else has asked if you can share the PowerPoint publicly. Um, is that something we could do? We could put it on the ASEMS website? Yes, yeah, that would be fine. Yeah, uh, definitely. I'm, I, I, will, I, will share, uh, I will send you the slides. Right. Okay. Thanks. So Rosanna, maybe that's an action for you to take. Yeah, I'll send for her. Yeah, yeah. I will send for Rosanna. Um, yeah. Um, I, there was a question someone asked, um, why do you differentiate people by skin color or race? It doesn't seem necessary or helpful. Why not just differentiate by socioeconomic bands? Are you happy to um, answer that? Well, we in the analysis and we control for social economic status. And uh, so we control the, for the uh, um, uh, social economic status and uh, professions and after controlling for that and uh, the um, um, black and uh, Hispanic and they are, uh, the effect are still significant. So what that means is the uh, social economic status and also existing medical conditions and so um, the, they cannot fully explain the health disparity we observe. So we have to do more to help those communities. Okay, thanks very much. And someone else has similarly asked that you said that males are at a high risk of infection than females. Does anyone have any thoughts about why that happens? Um, the, this data seems like vary from country to country. And so for example, in using the Wuhan data, we did not find a gender effect. And in US data, and it seems like there is a gender effect, but also that result seem to also vary from state to state. So in Massachusetts, it seems like the result is the other way around. So it seems like it's, uh, it's still more research is needed. Okay. And someone has asked, um, I don't quite understand what the question means. It says pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic cases can only be detected with contact tracing. I guess they're asking, is that the best way to detect those cases or are there other ways? Um, yes, and so there are two few things. And so compared to symptomatic cases, and those cases are much harder to detect. And uh, also, um, so therefore the testing is important. And uh, also the um, exposure assessment is important. So the, uh, and uh, so for contact tracing, it's important to do quickly. And so, for example, if somebody is uh, exposed and, uh, and uh, so even the person has not been, has not developed symptoms yet, and it's important to do contact tracing. And so the, um, the so if you recall, um, uh, let me see whether I can show you that slides here. Um, Yeah. 
So I'll um, I'll sh uh, sh show you this. Can you see the slides? Yes. Yep. Okay. So you can see this. Uh, this basically is the uh, the um, this is the uh, disease um, um, development process. And so this period between infection and the two presymptomatic infection, onset of presymptomatic infection, this period is called a latent period. So average is three days. And so during this period, and the PCR test has zero sensitivity. So basically one cannot detect. And in, during this period, and between the pre-symptomatic to symptomatic onset, and this period is um, is a period that a, a patient already has the uh, viral shredding. So that means the patient is infectious, and the, but the patient did not have symptom. So on average, this is about two days, and so therefore is a it's uh, very important that uh, contact tracing can happen early. And uh, so in this period, the uh, PCR test uh, sensitivity is not that great. And uh, so, so, so therefore it's important to do um, the, have in, in the PCR test. Uh, the sensitivity is during that period is probably about something like 50%-ish is, is not that great. And so therefore the exposure information is important. And also the, it's important that, that um, if a, a person can be tested twice. Okay. We're getting a lot of questions. I'll try and do my best to relay them. One person does thank you for such wonderful work and, and asked the question of what it was like to actually present to the UK Parliament Science and Technology Committee um, were the men, parliamentary members receptive to, to understanding statistical models, or did you have to change the way you communicate? Um, that's a really, really good question. And uh, so as a matter of fact, and as the testimonies, and uh, there was no slides at all, and basically it's a question and answer. And so I have to explain things in very layman language about the findings. Okay. And did, were they receptive in general? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, so they were, um, I think that at that time they were, um, I think that they were about eight to nine parliament members on the committees. And so, um, so I try to explain things because those things are quite intuitive and one can, explain things without any mathematics. And so it seemed like they, are, they were okay. <laughs> okay, we've got a question. Have you seen any evidence of environmental factors, for instance, a natural disaster affecting RT? Uh, we, have, uh, we don't have those data, so therefore I, I don't know. Okay, and the next question, I've got to admit, I don't know which country this is coming from, but because it certainly doesn't, some, it's not something I can relate to. But anyway, the question is, I know a lot of anti-COVID people around me and I'm really concerned. They keep saying that government is lying about numbers and they know people whose deaths have been incorrectly attributed to COVID-19. Do you have any thoughts? Mm, I know some countries and uh, they um, stop reporting numbers on the, that definitely is a worrisome. And um, so, yeah, I saw some news saying, like, uh, for example, like uh, Brazil, and uh, then the, 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 um, the numbers have uh, not been uh, properly reported. And uh, so it's important uh, to um, be transparent, especially at this critical time. And uh, so that will uh, help um, everybody uh, be engaged and work together. And uh, so, so, so therefore, I think the um, uh, transparency in data and also timeless in data reporting are critically important. Yeah, okay. And there is another question that asks about precisely that, um, that the criteria for confirming cases has varied between countries and over time. Do you have any sense of how that's developing? That is excellent question. So if you think about the um, uh, confirmed cases, and uh, so the, um, 
we analyzed in the Wuhan data in early days, and uh, so we analyzed the lab confirmed cases. And so in a short period of time, and uh, then they uh, also the the criteria changed. They they use the uh, the CT scans and uh, to define the cases. The later on, that find out was not. Uh, the, that uh, definition did not work quite well. So therefore, and uh, we restricted to the confirmed cases and by building this type of the um, uh, stochastic differential equation models accounting for unassigned cases. And uh, so, um, so this, uh, another issue is um, the symptoms. And uh, the symptom definition, um, have evolved over time as well. And so this reflects to uh, the fact that this is a new disease and there are lots of things we don't know. So for example, the, as I mentioned, the loss of taste and smell, this is the most important symptoms and not only funded by us, but also funded by um, a few other groups as well. And But this symptom was not recognized and uh, in uh, Wuhan and also that was, uh, um, uh, was not recognized uh, in U.S. in March either, and uh, so, so therefore, and uh, so when we say the asymptomatics, and uh, so those um, include uh, people who are really not symptomatic, and also who are those people who are mild symptomatic, and also because the symptom this definition involved over time. So therefore, like in, in the March, if somebody has lost and taste the smell, and those people probably would not be regarded based on the CDC definition, they were symptomatic. But in April, and the CDC and uh, updated their criteria, and uh, they will be regarded as symptomatic. Okay. We're getting close to time, and we do have a lot of questions. So I don't think I can ask all of them. I'll just pick out one or two more, if that's okay. Sure. Um, as a question that I would like to ask, and someone has asked it, what <laughs> data would you like to have that currently isn't available that would help you understand the pandemic more deeply? Uh, um, I think the, we, um, uh, we have to integrate a different type of data. And so it's, um, um, it's difficult to have a single data set answer all the questions. So therefore, it's important to first do the data sharing. And I think it's, it's for the epidemic right now, it seems like people are really, really good at data sharing, a different type of data. And so as uh, one look at, so like a lot of people really make a lot of effort and putting together the data at the county level, at the country level, social economic status, and uh, the uh, pre-existing medical conditions, and also those individual levels based on those apps, and also electronic medical record data, and also the more and more genetics and the genomics data available. So therefore, I think to really understand what's going on in the disease, and so it's really important that we have different type of data and try to integrate the different type of data as much as we could and try to understand the whole picture. Okay. We've got a few questions, I guess, more about medical things, which I'm not sure is going to help. I'll ask one more. Um, it's quite a long question, so I'll read it. Uh, there was mention of evidence-based policy. Should this also include the trade-offs of particular actions? Uh, extended lockdown can flatten the curve but leads to in increased disruption, mental health concerns, etc. The Swedish model of no lockdown will avoid, might avoid some of these con consequences. Do you have any thoughts on arguments for and against lockdowns um, as a long-term strategy, especially if no vaccine eventuates? This is an excellent question. And, um, so, yeah, and, uh, so this uh, mental health issues is... Uh, such uh, important issues and expecting uh, lots of lots of people. And uh, so um, the, um, uh, it's, I think that's not only affect the, um, uh, um, uh, uh, middle age or elder, elderly age people, but also affect the uh, uh, young children and the college, uh, um, college uh, uh, university students um, 
and uh, then also the vaccine uh, won't happen quickly. And uh, so I think I, I would um, it, I would not be surprised that it will be another 12 months. And uh, so um, so so therefore and. Uh, um, and also the treatment. And uh, so right now we still don't have um, um, uh, several treatments look uh, promising, and uh, but we still don't have um, a very effective treatment. And uh, so, so therefore the vaccine definitely is a priority, and treatment is a priority. And also that um, even um, with the vaccine, so like the uh, Dr. Fasi, Tony Fasi, who's uh, the director of NIAID, um, the uh, today, there was a news article saying that um, there was some evidence that uh, one third of the um, U.S. population uh, would not take the vaccine, even they are available. And so, therefore, we have many, many challenges. And with those, all those challenges, and so, so therefore, I think like for mental health, the social support is critically important. And uh, and uh, so, uh, through the communities and uh, also the families. Okay. Um, yeah, there's lots of questions. I'm sorry we're not going to get to all of them. Ji Hong, if you don't mind, one more. Um, sure. Sort of one that's quite important for the debate here in Australia, but uh, maybe if you've got some ideas. And it's just a simple question. Um, can you explain the impact of school closures on the COVID-19 epidemic curve? Do you know anything about that? Um, the school closure means the college were were. No, um, I think we're talking um, uh, elementary children's school. schools. Yeah, like oh, primary children. or secondary. Yeah, yeah, that that definitely. Um, I'm sure you know it well as well. You know it too. Online learning doesn't work well for children. And so I think that there are lots of concerns about um, uh, the. Uh, about the learnings and uh, for the children and uh, so the so how can one uh, because as we all know the children's risk is much lower and but the risk has increased over time and even the risk is very low and so the the like in Massachusetts and uh, for example uh, Massachusetts has decided that the school will uh, reopen in the uh, in the in the fall, and uh, but how to reopen it, and how to ensure social distancing, and uh, so um, then and also this how to reduce the the densities, and uh, and also that means that if reduce the densities, and then um, the, that will means more resources, and how the need more teachers, and uh, then. Um, this really a lot of lots of open questions and uh, so to ensure the students can learn materials and also to ensure their safety so these are really important question it really need a community effort and to work together to resolve it right well that's probably a good place to stop as i say i'm sorry if i didn't get to your question but there were really quite a lot um i'd like again to thank professor G that was that was an, a really fascinating seminar, and uh, I can tell by the the interest we've got from questions and also just having a look at the number of attendees that quite a lot of other people were similarly interested. Um, we will post the um, uh, the uh, PowerPoint slides on the ASEMS website, and there are quite a lot of references in those slides to um, papers on MedArchive that Professor Ling's been involved in that you can follow up if you're interested in following some of the more. Uh, detailed um, analysis of what's gone on. So thanks again. It was really good. And just imagine a, a, a huge round of applause, applause uh, Ji Hong, because you certainly deserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.